remit well known writer podcaster columnist shondip roy over to you shondip thank you and uh, welcome everybody happy republic day and uh, thank you for spending the afternoon with us it's warmed up but i'll i wore a kaida shawl so i have to keep it on and suffer for the sake of art and fashion um i am uh, i guess i should first just say that i'm a little sorry that the sort of burden of an entire continent has been placed on the three of you i know that if i was put on a panel and said many asias many stories i might feel a little nervous but uh, so we'll see where the conversation takes us but i thought since the subject was many africas many stories i would start by just asking each of you who were the writers you were growing up with and were there african writers at that time when you were sort of reading seriously that felt pivotal to you so maybe we'll start with you at the present gunna Uh, yeah, hi, thanks. Uh, when I was growing up, what was I reading? Let me tell you first of all that I was growing up at a time when we were still a British colony. So, what do you think we were reading? About flowers that did not grow anywhere, like daffodils and things like that. I had no idea. Well, we didn't have that problem because um, it was a boys' school, and they didn't bother us with things like flowers. Uh, but our teachers did think. i think uh that we would be interested in stories of adventure and so on and all of these will be stories with uh brave uh europeans doing clever things in various parts of the world um so i didn't get to read any of the uh then just beginning to be published african writers um i'm thinking because i uh finished primary school in 1963 So uh by then we had a Chinua Chebe I remember hearing about Ngugi wa Thiongo on the radio and all this kind of, but these were only just just coming into view these writers but I think for the group of people who came after us what I mean is that the, uh the the school children say 3 4 years behind us uh who therefore would have been reading after independence then they would have been reading those books almost certainly in their school curriculum and probably not reading anything about uh, brave european men doing brave things around the world was in it blighton a big deal in africa uh no i, I just told you in a boy school we don't read in it blighton in a boy school it was five they did boy boy adventures and... yeah, it, it was all sort of you know uh, the african queen and uh, uh the whatever the man eat of savo and that kind of thing Man, but grew- no no eni blighton i don't remember anybody mentioning eni blighton wow we grew up dream pocket meat sandwiches and when i went to britain and had it for the first time i didn't realize what a god awful thing it was <laughs> but damon um in my early years in fact i was raised on eni blighton um in in south africa under apartheid you know the notion of african literature was kind of marginalized and cancelled uh i think my first encounter with an african writer was chinua chebe things fall apart which made a big impression maybe the biggest um revelation uh on this topic came when i was about 18 and read uh, in the heart of the country jm could see um i suppose i'd internalized some sense that african literature was just by definition inferior mm. and uh kutsia was not only fellow south african but he was his writing was of a sort that i i suddenly realized not not only was he speaking from more or less the same place that i was but that he was doing so brilliantly uh so that kind of took the top of my head off but until then I'm afraid a very conventional childhood diet of uh, Tolkien and Enid Blyton. Yeah, sorry to confess it. What's your confession, Mark? Well, uh one of the, one of the first great books of African literature I was given 
was a book by Damon Gulgit, who was uh, 17 when he published it. It was his first novel called A Sinless Season. And it's not a great book, and sorry. I, I, was, I was 16 and my father knew I wanted to be a writer. And he put this book down and he said, look, he's 17, he's published his first book. And he, what are you doing, Mark? <laughs> you get to move on. But uh, Damon and I are, are, are the same generation of white South Africans. And, and we grew up in, in an environment where we, I mean, Damon said that he had hadn't internalized this notion of African literature as inferior. There was also an, a notion of Africa as being somewhere else. I mean, it's a very strange condition that white South Africans had, which is, I think, one of the reasons why there are such great white South African literateurs. And Nobel Prize winners, Booker Prize winners, Kutsir, Gordima, Galgit, because of this weird disassociation and uh, that, that, that we were raised with and, and, the, and the need to bridge it. Um, I, I really discovered my politics through African literature. And that was very exciting. Firstly, I, I, I learned about apartheid, even though I, I lived in apartheid South Africa and was a beneficiary of it. I really learned about it from reading uh, Nadine Gordimer and Andre Brink uh, as a teenager. I was like, wow, this is, this is what my people have done to other people. I, I had no idea. And then a little bit later, weirdly, even in apartheid South Africa, we were assigned Chinua Cherby's Things Fall Apart. And our teachers didn't know what to do with it. So they, they sort of taught it as a, as a kind of naive, primitive literature. That's really how we were, how we were it was taught to us. But if you were an intelligent reader, you, you, you were able to read between the lines and understand how it was a story about the destruction of African culture in, in many ways. So, yeah. But in, in the opening session, I don't know how many of you were here for the opening session when Nilanjana was speaking with. Um, okay, so in the opening session, you had mentioned that, um, you know, your first book was accepted and then the offer was withdrawn. Um, and at the same time, you are also doing your PhD in African literature. So it's a two part question where, what were you, what did you mean when you said you were not seeing yourself in that literature that was out there? And also were you given a reason as to why your book was withdrawn? Did it not fit somebody's idea of what a book from Africa should look like? Yeah, okay. Well, there are actually three questions there. So sorry to be pedantic. One <laughs> okay, the first one about the book being, uh, or rather the offer being withdrawn. Um, the series, the African Writers series, has uh, many, many uh, important historical dimensions. It was the first time that so many African writers were being published relatively cheaply, by which I mean that the the editions were paperback, were uh, printed, and certain kinds of paper. So it, it was the affordable books. The reason for this was because the the ethos, the idea behind it, was to have these books set in uh, African schools. Um, because I suppose the assumption was that there wouldn't be interesting necessarily for the uh, general reader in in Britain, for example. Um, and since uh, many African nations were then coming into independence, many of them, like ours, wanted uh, books that were by African writers. And I think I've, the Heinemann series was trying to cash in on that. So it was very important when they accepted a book the, the question I think that was always present is, is it likely to be set, as they put it? You know, is it likely to be selected on a curriculum? And uh, so they sent it to uh, their colleague in Nairobi who looked at it and said, no, <laughs> it's not likely to be set. And those are the grounds on which they said, no, no, we can't do this, which was fine because if that's the criterion, then it's okay, I'm, I'm happy to fail. Uh, that criterion. Um, was, was interrupt you. They, no, they, when you said it's not likely to be set in the curriculum, is that because it just become like a book, like your first book, talks about this um, dream that people have when they're all united against the common oppressor, who the colonizing power, 
And then when the colonizing power leaves, it does not create the sense of harmony for all the people left behind, the Arabs, the Africans, the South Asians who are all there. And they don't necessarily, did people want that kind of book to be set for the curriculum? Uh, I think it was more to do, well, it's to do with everything, really. It's more than one thing. But, for example, uh, any suggestion of anything, um, shall we say, to do with uh, sex uh, or any suggestion of uh, bad language? But most of all, what those the books at that time that were of interest to the curriculum setters were books that were uh, producing or suggesting um, uh, a progressive idea of reality and of the future. And, you know, after all, this independence just come. We don't want people to be depressed by, you know, difficult stories. We want stories that will speak somehow about a uh, uh, future, you know, a bright future uh, or an idea of, or possibly a horrible past. That's okay, because, uh, you know, then you're condemning colonialism or something like that. So it was that desire, I think, for for uh, sort of a progressive text uh, that that not only what I was writing could not uh, fulfill, but also, in fact, many of the texts that were chosen, and once they were chosen, then they stayed there, were ones that uh, came across as uh, either critiques of colonialism or something with a a more kind of idea of solidarity and progress progress and future and that kind of thing. Which makes me wonder whether anything similar like this happened post-apartheid in South Africa. Was there a, I mean, you talked about it in your session with Malvika, Damon, that uh, in a way it was easier when there was the, you could all be morally feel good about yourself and opposing the regime that's out there. When that is gone, you enter a far murkier territory uh, where uh, the current situation doesn't necessarily live up to the dream that had been peddled. But was there is this kind of pressure to still want to project this shining, hopeful, promising South Africa? I use the word promise, which is... <laughs> um, I think that was true for a period. Um... It, it became more complicated when those expectations fell away in a certain sense. Um, I mean, this is this is uh, coming at a slightly oblique angle, but I remember a time when I, I was struggling to get a book published. It was being turned down everywhere. Um, and my agent said, well, you know, we could try the Heinemann African Writers Series, but I'm not sure you want to be... Uh, I can't remember the word he used, but it was I, it, it was something to the effect, I, I, I don't think you want to be ghettoized in that way. And I understood him to mean that there's a certain set of perceptions uh, around what African writing is made of, and that it was different to the set of expectations and perceptions around other um, bodies of literature. Um, I didn't end up with the Heinemann African Writer Series. Uh, I can't remember how that went. They may have turned me down too. Um, I think there's a... I certainly know from other young writers trying to break in and, and get published outside South Africa that there seems to be a sort of a, a resistance to... Um, yeah. And, it, it went fairly rapidly from what South African writing in particular was supposed to be about to um, almost the opposite. It's, okay, we've done apartheid. We don't want to hear about that anymore. So you better be writing a book that's, you know, covering new ground, but nobody was quite clear on what that new ground might be. But I remember you saying when Promise came out, until it landed up in the Booker list, you weren't getting very many reviews in South Africa's English press. Well, I mean, that's a reflection more on South Africa, I think, than anything else. I mean, South Africa generally um, has still carried over what, what I mentioned earlier, the, that internalized sense that African writing is inferior to writing from the center. I use, uh, use inverted commas around that word. There is a notion that 
writing from Africa has first to be validated in Europe before we take it seriously out there. I mean, that's not all pervasive any longer, um, and there, you know, that that perception is shifting, but it's still there, it, especially with um, the English-speaking readership in South Africa. Afrikaans uh, literature, I have the impression, is far better supported in terms of um, having a willing readership. But that's because I think Afrikaans perceives itself as a language under threat. Um, and, you know, they, they're kind of drawn into a lager. There's a lot of, um, yeah, support for their own culture because they, the feeling is that it might be dying. I don't think it is dying, but um, that is the, their own self-perception. So, so just a, a thought about the validation from elsewhere, and uh, I'd be interested to hear what the other panelists also think about this. The, the validation is also commercial, right? Because um, uh, books do not, not so many books sell in African markets, right? So it's very hard to, um, to earn a living as a writer uh, with African readers alone. It's very hard to get publication deals with African readers alone. A, a lot of that has to do with distribution networks. Um, uh, the, the, tr trying to get one's book uh, distributed and sold, if you're South African, in, in other places in Africa, finding booksellers and distributors who are willing to do this in Nigeria and in Kenya and Tanzania, where there are readers, is, is very, very difficult. And, and there is this, as with so many um, disjunctures in Africa, there, there is this disjuncture between the number of people who read and love reading and love books. And you go to any African capital and there'll be photocopied books being sold to you by street sellers, um, particularly in Nigeria. Uh, the number of readers who love books and the difficulty of getting books to that, those readers is, a, is, a, is something that has not been overcome easily. Yeah, I, I think uh, Shashi Tharoor, who is a famous writer and politician here, often remarked about the dichotomy between the people who love reading books and the people who love to be seen around people reading books. So that's a much larger population. But taking off from what Damon was saying about South Africa, Mark, I was interested to know whether in sort of post-apartheid South Africa, where you've talked about uh, white, the currency of white guilt, of having been part of the system, even if you opposed it in principle, then when you, somebody like you takes on a figure like Thabo Mbeki, a controversial figure, but as a white South African, does it add an extra charge to the way you depict him? I don't know. So I, I, my, my, the only book I've ever had that was a bestseller was a biography of, of Nelson Mandela's successor, Thabo Mbeki a very controversial figure. Um, and in fact, a, a critic wrote recently that if I had tried to publish that book 10 years later in the current environment, it would not have been acceptable for a white man such as myself to, to write a biography that tries to get inside the mind of, of a black subject. Uh, I, I would be, it would not be acceptable given the woke politics of today. I, I don't know whether that's true or not. Um, and th th there's a whole other question there about about the, the writer's responsibility to, to empathy and to understanding the other and balancing that with um, stepping ba back to, to make space for, for people to write their own stories and tell their own stories. And, and those politics and those dynamics are very alive in, in South Africa, which is a highly charged, racialized society. What I think is interesting about South African literature, and I don't know if Damon would agree, is, is that there was a first stage um, after the end of a well, there was the white guilt stage, and, and, and I mentioned that I was weaned on that. And then the next stage was the stage of black people telling their stories under apartheid. Uh, and that, that stage was really driven by autobiography, um, uh, bearing witness to what happened, particularly people in the struggle. And I imagine there was something similar in the, in the Indian liberation struggle too. Then the third stage is a younger generation of writers who, as Damon said, are not interested. And there's a, there's a lot of speculative fiction. There's a, lot of, there's a kind of steampunk genre of young writers who are imagining uh, dystopias in, in, in South Africa's very crazy urban centers. Um, uh, there, there's, a, there's a lot of really interesting queer fiction 
uh, th 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 there's an attempt to kind of liberate oneself from history and imagine oneself. There, there are two terms that are used increasingly, and I like them both, um, uh, both in South Africa and elsewhere on the continent, Afropolitan and Afro-modern. And Afro-modern. And Afro? Modern. And Afro-modern. And then there's also Afro-futurist. And this is an attempt to say, we don't just write about our struggle and our difficult histories and, 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 and colonialism, we, we're, we're forward looking to. Uh, did you want to add something, Damon? Yeah, I just want to, I just want to say that the, you know, it's, it's complicated by the fact that most of this writing has to take place in English, simply because the industry is, is built around that. I mean, we have multiple indigenous languages, but there is no publishing uh, industry that's set up to, to deal with those. So you can talk about liberating yourself from colonialism, but you have to use the language of the colonists to do it. So this is an added level of complication, I guess. What do you think about that, uh, this uh, idea that, because you've said in the, you know, colonization, the period might be over, but, uh, but it remains, and uh, I think there's a line in uh, one of the books where you say, my friends, they have eaten you, you know, so have we been sort of, and this is true of us in India as well, I mean, at the Lit this is a country of so many languages, and many people writing in languages other than English often complain about the fact that the people who write in English, who reach a far smaller audience, but it's a much more influential audience. Is that, do you think that is an issue that's changing at all in Africa in terms of writing and what's getting published? Uh, well, I don't really know enough to be able to say it's, you know, to be able to kind of give a comprehensive answer to what's happening uh, in, in Africa. But I do have a, uh, uh, an, a, an idea as well about uh, what language uh, a writer writes in. And I think that's got to be treated, we've got to be uh, sensible about it. It's not just simply a matter of, uh, sort of national pride or, or national loyalty or something like that. There is a dimension of that and people who, who read and who speak about uh, writing uh, feel strongly in some cases about that. I want to say that to me, it seems important and precious for a writer to find a way of speaking that suits them, him or her. And if it's to be that uh, the writer finds the, that the, there is a kind of uh, facility or comfort in writing in um, the language, whether it's one of the non-English languages in South Africa or uh, uh, a non-English language of India, or whatever, fine, I applaud them. But if it turns out that the writer feels more comfortable writing in English, I applaud him or her as well. I don't think this is an, we, this is an issue uh, which is often politicized, um, and I would rather it wasn't. I would rather it was a matter of the choice is up to the writer. There is no obligation for a person to write. Mm. Nobody says, write a book. So if you choose to, Mark's father, but yeah, well, your publisher. So, well, that's that's a different thing as well because if you've already made the choice when you get to there, I'm saying there is no obligation to write. You choose to write, so you can also choose what language you want to write in and leave me alone. Is how I would and say. And for you, was this choice that you would write in English absolutely clear from the beginning? It it wasn't a choice, and I don't think it is a choice really, which language you write in. As I've expressed, that uh, it's something to do with what a writer feels uh, comfortable or feels a facility in. If I were to go and teach myself or learn rather uh, French, it might be that I will not be able to, uh, to write in that language or will try to write in Swahili, say, which is my first language, the same thing. The way these things come about, firstly, the British colonized us, so I learned English. And then at an early age, I discover I do have a certain um, ability, shall we say, to say things comfortably and sometimes in a complex way in English. So it's something that I was doing anyway, not because I wanted to be a writer or not because I wanted to write in English or anything like that. 
and so it goes on. So when it comes to the point where there is something to write, I don't think I asked myself, what language shall I write in? I was reading in English. I felt good writing in English, and I wrote it in English. And it worked in the end, but it wasn't, as we know, straightforward. Mm. So really, I do want to insist that I don't think these are always simply straightforward choices to sit there and say, I have these languages, which one shall I write in? I often use, and if anybody has heard me speak on this issue before, I often use a sporting metaphor. You uh, can't say, I want to be a high jumper. There has got to be something that allows you to be whatever sport it is that you become good at. And it seems to me that writing is also like that. There is luck in it, as well as intention or desire or whatever. I mean, your father may have said, be a writer, but there, was be, there would have been something in you that made it possible. It was in me. My father said, if you're going to be a writer, get published, like Gal got like published. Writing like got published. And, and I was curious, before I opened it up to the audience, whether... You know, that famous story about that baobab tree that had been on the cover of so many books about Africa. Somebody had once done a, a, a picture with all the different Africa books that had seemed to have that exact same tree. Whether any of you had faced any similar things in terms of, you know, whether it's cover choices or conversations with editors and where you felt their perception about what signified Africa rubbed up against yours? And anybody can take this. So there's a, there's a really wonderful polemic by a, a Kenyan writer named Binyabanga Wainana um, called How to Write About Africa. And, and I urge you to, to Google it and find it. It's this 1,000-word um, polemic about how if you're going to write about Africa, uh, you have to use the words safari and gorilla um, and you have to have in your subtitle, your life is Razak Zanzibar. Um, and, and you need to talk about, uh, you, need to have, you need to have something about Nelson Mandela and um, rainbows and reconciliation. And you need to talk about the light. You need to talk about the African light. And there needs to be a red sunset somewhere in your book because the African sunset is famously red. And, and the, first, my, the, the first book to be published internationally of mine was this biography of Thabo Mbeki, which was published by an American publisher. And the, um, it's a biography of a, a liberation leader, a great intellectual, um, really one, one of South Africa's greatest political intellectuals with an extraordinary history of struggle. And the, cover, the first cover came back with a red sunset on it. <laughs> <laughs> Did you all have any experience like that? Um. Not, not where covers are concerned, but um, without wanting to detract from the validity of um, what, you know, the point being made by parodies like that, um, there were a couple of, more than a couple, in fact, of nasty responses to my book a week, I think from, well, anyway, leave, oh, leave go, that part. Before. Go ahead, <laughs> you can't leave us hanging like this, Damon. No, no, I think there's a scent of sour grapes around a lot of these conversations. But I, um, the insistence that certain elements in a book, um, certain stock tropes, guarantee your publication or guarantee your success with a book is very effective in deflecting attention from what, what might be a quite different achievement with a book, which is its form. Um, I felt that quite strongly with a promise. I, I don't think um, it got noticed because of what was in it so much as how that was formulated. I mean, I might be flattering myself, but I think it's very it's it's oversimplifying a book to talk about um, you know the the constituent elements of the plot as opposed to how that particular author is is expressing and shaping those things. Yeah, I, I imagine that it's it's um, it's the way that marketing works. And um, maybe there is sometimes a desire to to simplify or to to not um, uh, credit the intelligence of the of the of the buyer or of the reader, um, or to find a you know the lowest common denominator as it were. An African book, yes, it has a baobab tree, or an acacia, or even a giraffe, or something maybe. Uh, but I think most intelligent publishers would probably 
not do that. Uh, it would, a, an interesting thing, because one of the great uh, and wonderful benefits of uh, being a, awarded something like the Nobel Prize is that your books get translated into many, many, many different languages. And it's been very interesting to me to see, uh, of course, I can't read what they are doing to the books, but I can see what the covers look like. And it is very interesting to see um, um, what kind of things do appear. And they're not all as straightforward as red suns or whatever, you know, like animals sometimes, <laughs> sometimes appear on the cover. And not always an animals that are found in Africa. <laughs> so even simplifying to that extent doesn't happen. So you think, yeah, well, you know, these are, these are marketing ploys. It doesn't alter what's in there. Uh, and presumably, uh, an intelligent reader would look at it and laugh as well as I do and say, what a stupid idea, because it's the book that you're reading, not the cover. Paradise with the cover of a Royal Bengal tiger. But uh, let me open it up for a couple of questions. Uh, we'll take one from the front, from the uh, lady in the side there, uh, maybe. Yeah. If you could keep it short yeah. and keep it as a question. Yes, um, I feel really very honored to, uh, you know, meet an author, uh, and one of my PhD scholars is working on Gurna. So thank you, sir. Um, well, uh, many African uh, writers uh, before you also, and you certainly, have broken the Eurocentric perception related to the stereotypes associated with the portrayal of African people. And uh, among them, of course, you mentioned them, Chinua Achebe and Bugi Wationgo. You have Uchiya Mecheta, famously, known for her narratives of displacement. And uh, you have, and in your works, all of them, you talk about uh, displacement and adaptation and appropriation of identity. And uh, it's more of an observation. It's very interesting how you try to uh, bring about a kind of uh, negotiation between the uh, you know the personal stories along with the historical context in which the, dis the, the displaced people are positioned in a host society all of your narratives and it talks about transcendence not just identity crisis but identity formation and transcendence thank so you thank you so much this is professor dr chandrani biswas department of english and Xavier's college and university thank, thank you. you sir um a question uh Oh, that's it. If... Thank you. My question is for Professor Gurna. Uh, sir, first of all, uh, I will. I would love to make a confession. I just got married. Next to me is sitting my wife. Congratulations. Yesterday. Congratulations. So, sir. I, I missed out uh, your uh, your session on 23rd. I think you're forgiven if yes, you're getting yes, married yes, at yes, the yes. same time. But I had to come. Even I too didn't have a choice, so I had to come just for you and uh, thanks to Kolkata Literary Meet. So uh, my question is that uh, just a few minutes back, uh, Mr. Damon Galgat and others and you, all of you were talking about a validation from the center uh, that an African author, I, I think it's, it was same for the Asian authors and still it's the same, that uh, we need validation from the center to get celebrations, to get celebrated in our own nations. But is it changing in any way? Has it started changing? Because I think it helps as well if you get published from the so-called center, it, uh, it, it somehow creates a distancement in the mind of the readers as well. It helps us to think of, to not, not to think of Africa as exotic as we used to think some years ago. Okay, let me try. Any of you want to take that on? Okay, let, let me have a go. The problem is not where books are published. I know that's part of it, because um, it then means, say, that uh, if they're published in the UK, they're more expensive to buy in Tanzania or in India or in South Africa or whatever. Perhaps if they're published locally, they might be cheaper. The problem, I think, is uh, also to do with uh, somehow uh, bringing about a reading public. 
people who want to buy books. You're mentioning earlier on how books don't sell. Mark, you're saying books don't sell uh, in Africa. Part of the reason is because people don't have the money for the books. It's not much more complicated than that. That is to say, if they're, if they're deciding what to spend their money on, the other reason is that there isn't a, a culture that says reading for pleasure. People read because that's the, what they're asked to read, because it's set in the uh, school curriculum, or possibly because they want to find out some information of a particular kind. So that you can't bring about just like that, even if you publish locally. And publishers, you were saying earlier, writers can't live on, uh, on their work. Publishers can't live on their production either because they can't get people to buy the books. Well, so until that changes, it has to be that you have to publish wherever you can publish. So you need to go buy books right now from the store. Well, we're trying to take a question from the back there. I feel like the back always gets neglected. Right at the end, uh, the lady, yeah. Firstly, thank you. It's been a stellar panel. Uh, my question is, as writers of either African descent or people, or as people who reside in Africa currently, how do you resist the urge to either exoticize or totemize what is going to be regarded as an acceptable version of African culture or experience? Because you have mentioned that you need, um, you need to encourage readership across the world. So how do you do that in your daily practice? Damon? I, I don't know. It's it, it's a question. Uh, I, I'm African. I'm fourth generation African. Uh, I only think of myself as African. Um, I don't think of myself as anything other than African and South African. Well, I think of myself as Jewish and queer as well. But my writing comes from all those identities. Um, even when I write as a journalist about other people, which is what I do, I write nonfiction. So it's it's not something that is self-conscious. It just is. I don't know if that's a cop-out, but that's that's all I could say about it. Any last thoughts from either of you? Yeah, I'd, I'd just um, support that response. You, you don't, as a writer, sit down and think, how can I um, convey an authentic image of myself as an African? You simply write out of the fact that you are an African, and it is, by definition, authentic. Um, you know, how how authentically you represent yourself, I guess, is really the determining factor. I, d I don't think that much about who's reading me. I, I think about how effectively I'm conveying what it is I want to convey. I think we're going to unfortunately have to end here. Um, our organizers are vigorously nodding their head, but our authors will be around. So I think you can continue the conversation at the bookshop or um, they sign the books. But thank you so much for spending the afternoon to us. And please thank our three panelists. Okay. Thank you. Here, let us. Uh, A huge thank you to our eminent panelists.